Chapter 2, Detective Roy Arrives One of the weekly excitements of the Longview Village was the arrival of the steamer from Glasgow bringing mail, merchandise, and occasionally visitors. As there was no place for the ship to dock, so it anchored some distance offshore, where passengers and freight were transferred to a small boat and rowed ashore. It was almost like the arrival of a ship at one of the South Sea Islands, for most of the inhabitants would run out of their cottages to see the boat come in. A steamer had just dropped anchor in the bay. Through the early morning mist, the people on shore watched every movement on the vessel while a fisherman with a telescope reported details. Mel's are off now, he said. Dog's coming over. Suppose that's for Peter MacDonald. Don't seem to be any passengers. Oh yes, there's a boy climbing down, and a man just getting ready to follow. Don't seem to know him. Perhaps they're the folks that are coming to stay at the store. That's all. Now she's off again. They don't wait long, do they? As he finished, the steamer began to glide away to the north, and the tiny rowboat started on its return journey. The two passengers proved to be the complete strangers to the village. The man was a Mr. Wallace of Liverpool, who had been asked by his brother, General Storekeeper of Longview, to spend his summer vacation in this quaint old place. Delighted with the offer, he had just arrived with his 14-year-old son, Roy, who, needless to say, was as happy as any boy would be with such a holiday before him. It was not long, to be sure, before the newcomers were told of the recent mysterious happenings in the village. Mr. Wallace did not seem particularly interested, but Roy, he pricked up his ears to catch every detail and felt himself swelling into a real detective all at once. Here was adventure waiting for him. Could any vacation ever have started out more fortunately? At first, he could see no connection between the cave, the boat, the horse, and the herring. Yet, as he turned the matter over in his mind, he thought that at least there might be some slender thread joining the four mysteries. But what was it? What could it be? He was determined to find out. The village, being a small one, he became very acquainted with everybody in it. Cautious, he drew from one and all everything they could tell him about the remarkable events of the past few days. Some of the kind-hearted villagers sent him up to the gamekeeper's house to find Oscar and Bruce. Lads about your own age, as they said. Not finding them at home, he returned to the store. That afternoon, he walked along the shore to take a look at the celebrated cave. The tide was low, so he was able to get quite near, but there was nothing to see except the black opening. Somehow, he didn't feel like climbing the steps. Not just then. Not till he found out more about it. There was, of course, just the possibility that someone might be inside. That same night, or rather the next morning, Longview inhabitants, Roy included, had another puzzling thrill. About a month before, one of the fishermen, after much hard savings, had purchased one of the most up-to-date and expensive corf life jackets. To wear his new treasure and to listen to the admiring comments of his associates was his pride and joy. Then came a sad day. One fine evening, when he went home from his boat, he forgot that he had left the jacket lying on the deck of his vessel. That very night, a gale arose and the sea dashed over all the boats lying on the shore, washing everything away that was not securely fastened including the much-prized jacket. The man was unconsolable for a day or two and continued for some time to grieve over his loss. Picture then his amazement and joy when upon opening his front door one morning, he saw the long-lost cork life jacket right in front of him, securely suspended from a nail. How had it gotten such a place? It must have been put there sometime after 11 p.m., for he had not gone to bed till then, and before 5.30 a.m. when he had opened the door. However, despite the most careful inquiries, not a clue could be found as to who had put it there. Roy with the villagers was completely puzzled. Who had done it, and was there any connection between all the recent ghostly happenings? Was the cork jacket related to the noise in the cave? In desperation, he determined to forget the whole affair for that afternoon and go for a good long swim. Starting off briskly, he soon covered a considerable distance. As he began to feel tired, he crawled into a small rock that was jutting out of the water and rested a while. Diving in again, he proceeded to another rock, and thence, after a brief rest, to another. Thus he went on, gradually getting farther and farther away from the village. At last, he felt he should go no farther, and decided that, after one final rest, he would return. Sitting on this last rock, he chanced to look shoreward. To his surprise, he found he was almost opposite the entrance to the cave. The opening looked small, for he was several hundred yards away from it, but it was quite distinct. And what was that? Surely his eyes did not deceive him. Something was moving in front of the cave. He looked again. Yes, it was a figure. But who it was, he could not distinguish. Unfortunately, in his excitement, Roy had forgotten his own perilous location. As he rose to his feet to get a better view, he lost his footing on the slippery rock and fell with a great splash into the water. When he came to the surface and could again look toward the cavern, the figure had disappeared. Continue listening.